the next session. Uh, we have a very interesting um, session coming up by Mr. Somik. He's a machine learning engineer at Weeks and Biases. So I think we should begin. Uh, Somik, can you start? Uh, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to speak about is uh, basically a, a implementation of a very baseline image restoration model using Keras. So before we start a little bit about myself, uh, um, as you can see, uh, uh, I am Samik Rakshit and as I have been introduced, I'm, I'm a machine learning engineer at Weights and Viases and I'm also a Google developer expert in JAX, uh, the first from India. And uh, uh, so you can follow my content uh, on two minute papers uh, on uh, fully connected and uh, you can follow me uh, on GitHub. I am pretty active in the open source. I have contributed uh, to uh, Keras documentations and code examples on keras.io. Um, and also uh, I build uh, open source integrations uh, of different repos like Yolo V5 uh, with uh, Weights and Biases. So let's get started with the actual interesting stuff, uh, which is image restoration. So uh, now we all know about image restoration. It's basically restoring uh, corrupted images uh, uh, so that, uh, you know, uh, uh, to make them free of uh, any kind of corruption, which might uh, be introduced as JPEG com uh, compression artifacts, which might be due to uh, taking them in a very low light environment. Uh, uh, they can be uh, due to, uh, you know, being downscaled. Uh, so uh, the type of image restoration that we will be discussing today is basically caused by the existence of haze in the atmosphere due to the presence of aerosol particles such as dust, mist, fumes, smoke, fog, etc. Uh, and it basically uh, degrades the image quality that is cut, captured by cameras. Um, and uh, why is this particular type of uh, image restoration uh, important? Uh, why is it crucial? So uh, it's because uh, a lot of high level computer vision tasks such as object detection, image recognition, segmentation, panoptic segmentation, et cetera, they do not work very well when, uh, when they are trying to operate on a hazy image. Uh, where the contrasts are reduced and surface colors become faint. So I'll, I'll show you quickly an example. So uh, here, here's a uh, perfectly fine image, which is basically detecting a chair here. Uh, there's no kind of uh, haze uh, in used in this, but when we algorithmically induce uh, some sort of uh, haze uh, in this image, the a state of the art uh, object detection model like Yolo V6 confuses and misses out the objects completely. Uh, so, and a similar case in this case also, like uh, as you can see, without any haze, uh, we are detecting three objects here. Uh, but once uh, the haze is in, uh, introduced, like it's all over the place. So this this is the reason image dehazing is. Uh, a fairly uh, well explored problem in computer vision, I would say, um, and is also a quite challenging, uh, challenging instance of uh, the image restoration and enhancement problems in general. So uh, in this uh, report, basically, uh, we would now talk about uh, this particular paper called an all in one uh, network for dehazing and beyond. So this was one of the first papers, like uh, the paper is uh, really old. Okay, so it came out around five years ago. And uh, this was one of the first papers to basically propose an end to end trainable model for image dehazing. Um, and uh, basically, which means you can train it uh, directly in a supervised manner to produce a hazy image from a clean image without any kind of empirical steps in uh, in in between. So uh, we would uh, explore uh, this paper. Uh, we would explore the problem, and we would explore uh, an implementation using TensorFlow and Keras. Uh, so uh, let's let's uh, take a look at the data set before you know we jump right into the uh, problem of uh, coding in Keras and uh, coding the model. So. Uh, 
uh, what you are seeing here is are basically uh, weights and biases weave panels, which uh, are basically visualizations of three data sets uh, combined into a single uh, data set artifact uh, on weights and biases. So what are artifacts? Artifacts are basically, uh, you know, a feature of weights and biases, which enables you to uh, model and, uh, you know, to version your models and data sets uh, properly. Uh, you might have multiple versions of your data set. You might be con continuously refining your data. So you can do that uh, with artifacts and artifact storage. So this data set that we will be using has uh, basically three data sets, three uh, real world data sets rolled into one. Uh, the first one of which is DHAZY, which is basically a depth induced version of the NYU depth data set. Uh, we will uh, use the DHAZY data set as our primary training data source. Uh, we also have the OHAZE and the IHAZE data set, which uh, are basically challenging instances of uh, indoor and outdoor images, which uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, can be used as really nice benchmarks to test our uh, image dehazing model. Uh, so, like, as you can see, uh, the data set uh, for our training and validation is basically like you have an input uh, hazy image. Which, which is synthetic and uh, generated using the depth maps from the NYU depth data set. And uh, we are expected uh, to learn a representation of the clean image. So let's, let's take a brief look at the input data pipeline. So uh, we use basically weights and biases to uh, track our experiments and uh, to make our experiment rep reproducible. And uh, to do that, we uh, initiate a weights and biases run, uh, which will show up on your weights and biases dashboard. And uh, we set a couple of configs uh, uh, to be synced with you, with our weights and biases run. So why do we need to uh, sync our configs so that uh, certain things like uh, the seed, uh, the learning rate, uh, um, and uh, uh, maybe the number of epochs, the batch size, and a couple of that. Anything and everything which can change the results and the state of our experiment, we are thinking uh, as configs on weights and biases uh, because uh, for the sake of uh, rep reproducibility for uh, future reference. So uh, I'm not showcasing the complete code in this report, I would say. I would rather encourage you to uh, visit the collab uh, notebooks in your spare time to take a look at the code in detail. but. I would uh, like to explain some of the most in more interesting parts of the code uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, the rest uh, you can take up on your free time. Uh, so what we do here is basically fetch uh, this particular artifact here, the DHIS dataset artifact from weights and biases. What this does is uh, creates a particular thing called lineage. Uh, so what lineage is basically, um, you are using this particular artifact to perform multiple experiments. So what happens is that uh, there are multiple versions of uh, this data set and stuff like that. So Lineage basically provides you with an uh, interactive interface to figure out which artifact was used to perform which particular experiment or which artifact is linked to which particular weights and biases run. So uh, the Lineage is taking a little bit of time to load uh, uh, since, you know, it's a it, it, it's uh, quite a heavy widget on the browser. My internet connection not be, might not be that well. Uh, we will move on um, uh, to the input data pipeline. So uh, we are using the tf.data API basically to uh, create uh, uh, our input data pipeline. Uh, the why we are using tf.data instead of you know directly loading the uh, data set into the memory. So one of the things is that uh, uh, on Colab, uh, on which we will be training our model, uh, there are restrictions with respect to the GPU memory and um, to avoid that and yet to make our training pipeline fast and not make our accelerator starve for uh, incoming data. We are using uh, TF data, which is basically a really fast uh, and simple to use data set API, which is provided to us uh, by TensorFlow. Um, Hello. Hello. Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt, but some people find the font small. Can you please increase uh, it? Sure. Uh, just let me know if uh, the, this is okay. I can zoom further. 
Is this fine? A little bit more. Is is this fine? Yeah, let's go ahead. Good. Uh, so uh, what we are seeing here is basically uh, uh, the load function, uh, the data load function, which basically does very simple things like uh, read the images from the image paths. And uh, we also apply random crops to the both the input and the ground truth images uh, using the random random crop function. Uh, now, again, as I mentioned before, uh, I'm not uh, going to describe each and every line because uh, that would uh, we would be really here uh, all day if, if I do that. So I would encourage you to you know check out the collab notebook, which has the definition of all these functions uh, 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 as per your free time. So uh, what we are doing here is then uh, uh, we are basically creating a TensorFlow dataset object, tf.data.dataset object from uh, tensor slices, which are basically a list of uh, image files uh, corresponding to the input and the ground truth images. And uh, on top of this data set, we are basically mapping our data loading function which is basically, uh, as you can see, this particular partial function is basically a function of just the input and the ground truth image. So we can map this function using the map, cons uh, map transform. And uh, after that, we apply batching to our data set using the batch transform. Uh, uh, as you can see, batching is basically stacking n, n number of data points together uh, so that, you know, because uh, we want to utilize the scope of parallelization of our accelerator to the fullest, right? Uh, and finally, basically, we create uh, the data sets, uh, which are batched and mapped data sets uh, on top of our input and ground truth images. And uh, uh, these data sets, uh, which correspond to the training and validation data sets, will be used for uh, training that. So, uh, and yes, as you can see that we will be training our model on uh, an image size of 256, which means we will be using random crops generated from the uh, images, uh, which are 256 by 256 in size, and we will be using a batch size of 16. So now let's move on to the formulation of the problem, uh, The this particular all-in-one dehazing network, which uh, was proposed by the paper we referred earlier. So uh, what is the interesting crux of uh, interesting uh, uh, you know, innovation that this uh, paper brings to the table. So to understand that, we first need to take a look at the atmospheric scattering model uh, for uh, which, which is basically a classical description of uh, hazy image generation. And since it's a description of hazy image generation, to conversely, it's it it can be applied for, to image dehazing also. So this particular uh, equation uh, is uh, given by the atmospheric sc uh, scattering scattering model, which basically means that the uh, observed heavy, hazy image is given by ix and uh, jx is basically the uh, clean image. A here denotes the global atmospheric uh, scattering light and tx is basically a transmission matrix. Uh, so uh, the thing is that uh, this is a description of hazy image, right? But we are interested in finding the clean image. So uh, given this equation, we can write it in this manner, right? Uh, so if we it's you know classic uh, algebra uh, if we apply. So we can take Jx to the left-hand side. So uh, this basically gives us this particular equation, uh, this particular form of the equation, which in, uh, which is written uh, in terms of the hazy image instead of the clean image. Uh, that's why I had uh, said previously that uh, the atmospheric uh, scattering model can be conversely applied for image dehazing as well, because we have we now basically have our problem formulation of the hazy image. But uh, there are a couple of problems with respect to this particular problem formulation is that uh, there are two unknowns in this uh, equation, which is the transmission matrix and the, uh, and the uh, at, uh, global atmospheric uh, light uh, parameter, which we need to estimate. Um, but uh, the thing is that, uh, a lot of previous papers which came before all-in-one dehazing network, um, uh, such as dehaznet, multi-scale CNNs, uh, uh, they basically tried to do, uh, you know, learn a representation of Jx by 
technically by learning uh, only the transmission uh, matrix Tx and uh, then estimating uh, the parameter A, which is a global atmospheric like using, uh, you know, some kind of empirical me method. So uh, this uh, means that essentially your, uh, uh, you know, your prediction is a two-step uh, function, which is not being trained by a, a unified loss function. So what happens is that, uh, you know, no machine learning, as we know, no machine learning method is perfect. So the errors which are accumulated in uh, uh, calculating the transmission uh, matrix, they basically stack up with the errors which are, uh, you know, created during the reconstruction uh, uh, phase, which is while estimating uh, the parameter A using some kind of empiri empirical method. These uh, multiple steps basically create uh, errors to stack up and basically blow out of proportions, which, which means like, uh, which the TLDR is basically, you know, the more steps you will have in estimating the clean image, basically the more errors, uh, more chances are for the errors to accumulate. Uh, so what is the core idea behind AODNet uh, or by AODNet, uh, we mean uh, the all-in-one dehazing network. So uh, the idea is basically uh, to unify the transmission uh, matrix and the global atmospheric light. Like, uh, what I mean is to unify Tx and A into a single expression, which is given by Kx. So as you can see, uh, the, uh, you know, the atmospheric scattering model, uh, which was given by this particular equation, now uh, you can say, uh, you can write it like this. Uh, okay. Or, or uh, like, uh, like, uh, in terms of kx so what kx is basically kx is just a pixel domain representation of tr the transmission uh, matrix and the global uh, uh, atmospheric light so uh, instead of predicting two different things we will be just predicting one single thing our, uh, we can train our model to uh, you know just uh, uh, predict uh, uh, this one particular thing called kx as we can see in this uh, diagram below so uh, the pipeline basically boils down to given a hazy image, there is a deep neural network, which basically, uh, which we are calling the K estimation module, which is basically, uh, you know, uh, estimating the Kx, which, which is basically learning the representation of Kx. And instead of, uh, you know, judging the image on how well it basically uh, estimates the Kx, we are instead applying the uh, atmospheric scattering model on top of the Kx to get the clean image and basically applying the reconstruction lock loss on top of the clean image. This means that we have only one, uh, uh, you know, optimization problem, which takes care of all uh, parameters uh, in this particular uh, uh, problem of uh, image dehazing. So uh, if you're interested, uh, you know, in this modified uh, expression, uh, Kx is basically, uh, you can write Kx in terms of Tx and A. Uh, it, it's this particular, expression and uh, you know uh, one thing to be noted is b is basically a constant bias uh, for the sake of simplicity i would uh, for our implementation i have kept the bias as one so now that uh, we know that we are supposed to uh, you know train a neural network to predict kx uh, we now have to understand what uh, this neural network architecture looks like so instead of innovating too much uh, on the architecture, uh, I went with the architecture that was proposed in the paper itself. Uh, and this is the proposed architecture of the K estimation module. So uh, we implement uh, this in a very standard manner using uh, tf model as a subclass uh, model uh, using the Keras functional API. And uh, the forward propag propagation basically looks like this. Uh, so you have the K estimate output of the K estimation module and they, which you basically take and uh, just apply the atmospheric uh, scattering model simply on top of this to get your output. And the layers are all, uh, you know, uh, standard uh, Keras layers. So a few things to uh, note is that, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of concatenation going on across multiple scales. So as you can see, one into one convolutions are being uh, uh, like the con one uh, is being uh, concatenated with uh, conf two, 
to f- uh, form concat uh, one and uh, there's uh, this uh, concat uh, con two is being concatenated with con three to form concat two and uh, con uh, concatenate three is basically using uh, you know four concatenating four different feature maps uh, so uh, the point of such a uh, you know multi scale design is basically uh, to capture features uh, you know at way more different scales uh, compared to the previous uh, iterations of uh, the uh, image dehazing uh, neural networks and uh, the intermediate connections also compensate for the information loss during convolutions which makes your gr- gradient less likely to vanish uh, let's just say uh, so again like uh, i encourage you to all go and run the collab notebook in your free time if you can uh, uh which gives you a more comprehensive uh implementation of the code all we will be discussing in this uh talk is basically the key implementation details and the uh, key idea behind image dehazing and we will also get to explore some cool results using an app so uh now it comes down to training the all in one dehazing uh network uh so the matrix we are using are very standard for any kind of image uh, restoration formulation which are peak signal to noise ratio and uh, structural similarity index measure which we implement using uh, implement uh, using tensorflow as stateless matrix uh, uh, we didn't go into the complexity of implementing them as stateful ones because you know they they are literally don't have any state so it, uh, this is a pointer i want to mention that if you if there's a uh, necessity of uh, going with a stateful uh, matrix implementation uh, for any special case you can do by subclassing the tf.keras.metric class uh, but uh, that was not the necessity in this case so we avoided that and uh, what we are doing here is basically defining the eodnet model and uh, yes we are using adam optimizer to train our model uh, the mean squared error is basically used as a reconstruction loss and uh uh one interesting uh experiment that i tried is i tried to use uh, try to train two versions of uh this dehazing model uh which one of which basically uses a fixed learning rate which uh, the authors actually used uh in their own implementation and uh they uh, and and i also tried to experiment with a learning rate scheduler which basically uh, you know decays the learning rate uh uh you know every op- optimizer step uh, uh like a cosine function so it's called cosine annealing dk uh, which you can implement very simply using uh, the keras api and we compile our model finally with uh, the loss function the optimizer and the matrix in place so now before we start training the model i want to discuss a little bit about you know um how experiment tracking with weights and biases works so uh uh we uh have these three particular callbacks uh which you can chain uh as per your requirement i wanted to showcase each and every one of them uh, uh so that uh you know like these callbacks are pretty actually new uh we have revamped our keras integration uh and uh we have made them more flexible flexible easy to use and easy even easier to build on top of uh you'll see in a moment what i mean by build on top of so uh, there's a one dimi matrix logger which basically you know uh, tracks all your experiment logs automatically in real time on your wetson basis dashboard pretty simple stuff right uh, uh, any uh, if if you have used a, a similar experiment tracking tool called tensorboard uh, wetson basis works uh, the one dimi matrix logger callback works almost similar to the tensorboard callback uh, just it can uh, even host a tensorboard instance on your wetson basis uh, dashboard if you want or you can use wetson basis uh, uh, natively to track uh, and log your experiments which we are doing in this case because the results are way easier to share and uh, share in a universal manner uh, we are also using the one dimi model checkpoint callback which is uh, very similar to the keras uh, model checkpoint callback which basically you know saves uh, your model weights uh, and checkpoints your uh, model uh, uh, after every epoch or even if you want you can do it after every batch 
the thing that we are uh, providing is with uh, one DB model checkpoint callback is basically you can automatically sync your callbacks and version them uh, as weights and biases artifacts. And uh, I'll show you in a moment what we need by, uh, you know, version them uh, and uh, for as weights and biases callbacks, uh, as uh, weights and biases artifacts, uh, I'm sorry. And uh, the next most interesting uh, of the callbacks, I would say is one DB eval callback. Uh, so, what one db eval eval callback is basically it's not a callback which you can directly chain um, uh, in your workflow it's a special callback which is only used to visualize the results of your model prediction as uh, uh, from your uh, let's say your validation data so what happens is that uh, when we are training our model so it progressively learns uh, to better itself to produce uh, clean images uh, on the validation data, right? That's what we expect it to. Do. But uh, uh, what one db eval callback lets us to do is visualize this entire process, how progressively it gets better. So again, I'll uh, uh, ask, uh, like, uh, request you to go and visit this particular collab, which also demonstrate how you can build your own visualization callback using the 1db eval callback. I'm not uh, going into the details. Again, we will uh, be here sitting all day uh, in that case. But uh, this is the callback which uh, we created, uh, we built for our particular uh, task, which is image dehazing for uh, on top of 1db eval callback, which is the dehazing evaluation callback. And uh, we will be basically uh, visualizing how the prediction of the model is evolving each and every epoch and also how it is evolving in terms of the peak signal to noise ratio and structural similarity which are our business metrics in this case so as you can see i have chained all three weights and biases callbacks for training and uh, tracking the experiment logs for tracking the model sequence and for visualizing the uh, performance of the model so after that, all we need to do is, you know, just call model.feedback, uh, model.fit on uh, our training and validation data sets and, uh, you know, pass in our callbacks. So uh, the advantage of our callbacks is this uh, weights and biases report. Uh, this thing that we are seeing on screen right now is a weights and biases report. Uh, and we can basically embed our experiments, uh, the results of our experiments here, uh, uh, like uh, uh, like you can see uh, in the, on the screen. So you know, pretty standard stuff, the training loss is reducing. Uh, oh, one interesting thing to note is that uh, the validation loss, uh, you know, suddenly takes off uh, after the uh, after the 17th epoch, uh, let's say, which is not a good thing. So, and this only happens for the experiment, uh, which was trained using the cosine annealing DK. So that's an interesting thing to notice. Uh, uh, like, one of the things that might have occurred is because the gradients exploded due to some reason. Uh, one way to fix this could be to apply uh, gradient normalization or gradient clipping on our data set to prevent them uh, on our gradients, uh, on our model gradients uh, to prevent them from exploding. Uh, so as you can see, uh, due to this, uh, around the same uh, position, the 17th epoch, the uh, for, for this particular experiment, the cosine uh, LRDK, the the uh, even the uh, uh, peak signal noise ratio on the validation data set uh, uh, takes a nose dive and also the structural similarity so it's it's very clear that uh, you know we uh, we have a simple case of exploding gradients and uh, we know kind of uh, what we need to do to fix that so uh, now that uh, I, I was, I have been talking uh, about the one DB eval callback and the dehazing evaluation callback that we built on top of uh, the one DB eval callback. You know, creates a table that is similar to this. So for uh, at epoch zero, if given this hazy image uh, and given this ground truth image, the predicted image is kind of like this on the validation data set, and this is uh, you know uh, the. PSNR and the SM values that uh, were at epoch zero. Now, uh, this particular visualization, in my opinion, doesn't tell us a lot uh, about our model's journey. So let's do some magic. Uh, let's let let us, uh, you know, group by uh, epochs. And and okay, I, like we want to see that uh, you know how how uh, uh, our latest versions of our model is performing. So let's just sort. Uh, our epochs uh, in descending order. So if we do that, basically, 
we can kind of compare uh, like, okay, on this particular instance, how is it performing? Uh, on this particular batch of data on Epoch 29, how is it performing with respect to Epoch 28 or let's say Epoch 27? So this is a complete, uh, uh, you know, uh, histogram of all the PSNR values in this particular batch for this particular epoch. And this basically gives you an idea how your model uh, has been learning, how your model has been evolving uh, uh, throughout the training journey. And uh, also one of the more in in interesting things that uh, your uh, the 1DB matrix logger callback basically uh, lets you track is the system metrics, which uh, might be uh, your GPU and CPU utilization. Uh, as you can see, like it, uh, like our training, uh, AP, uh, our uh, uh, GPU utilization uh, has been quite uh, low because our model is actually pretty small. Uh, and uh, also like uh, the GPU power usage and stuff like that, if that's relevant to you. Uh, and it's uh, relevant to a few use cases uh, where you know you are doing distributed training or you are trying to uh, find out which uh, version of your model is a smaller version so that you can run it faster in a production environment uh, or stuff like that. Uh, these uh, uh, insights are actually kind of important in those particular cases. Uh, but here we have just one version of the model uh, since we are definitely not using the version of the model that uh, exploded in which the gradients exploded, right? So uh, we will uh, just uh, uh, go with the version of the model that uh, was uh, that uh, we saw uh, by the experiment logs were performing perfectly, which is this particular version. As you can see, train fixed LR. It was this particular artifact was created by the train fixed uh, LR uh, experiment, uh, which was trained using a fixed learning rate. And uh, uh, the files, if you see, it's a it's a Kera saved model uh, file, and you can use it very simply using just these lines of code in your workflow, in your inference workflow. So, uh, uh, and you can also see the experiment logs, the uh, the the configs uh, that were used to create this model uh, here. So this is again ensures a lot of sanity. And uh, in case uh, you have multiple models, you're training multiple models and trying to figure out which model to take into production, uh, saving them as artifacts basically creates multiple version of uh, them, uh, which basically uh, helps you keep track of all of your experiments uh, to get better insights. Um, now, basically, we will take a look at some of the uh, evaluation results, which uh, uh, we basically performed on the DHES data set the, and the OHES data, data set, which are, you know, um, uh, vision, uh, which, are, which basically consist of uh, outdoor HES images. So uh, one thing we can uh, do is uh, which 1DB tables, this particular widget you're seeing is a 1DB table. What it allows us to do is uh, uh, it allows us to filter our table. So currently we are seeing the DHES train uh, data set. Uh, what if I want to see the DHES validation data set? So what I can do here is write row of data set uh, is equal to the DHES validation data set and click apply. So you will have all, you have basically applied a filter for all the cases in which the validation data set, uh, uh, which, which are basically part of the validation data set. If I want to look at, you know, performance of the OHESI uh, on the OHESI data set, I can just change it to OHESI and voila, you, the images take a little bit time to load. And you can see, uh, so the Hayes, uh, so the OHAZI data set is kind of a more challenging use case for, uh, you know, trying to figure out the edge cases for uh, the, uh, for, uh, with respect to our model. Uh, but uh, uh, as, as we can see that our model is not performing that well on the OHAZI data set. Uh, so this gives us a really good insight as to maybe we need to improve our model uh, in some respect. Uh, maybe we need to go back to our drawing board and change a few things because uh, we want our model to perform well on challenging scenarios as well. So at last, basically we provide an interactive demo to 
play uh, play with uh, we have built this demo using grad.io and uh, you can basically run uh, this demo on a google collab so let us basically try to do that uh, quickly uh, this is the collab notebook you can uh, simply open up the collab notebook i have already opened it here and we will just run it We'll first install the dependencies and then launch a Grad.io app uh, for us, which we which uh, has an interface uh, similar to this. You can select the which version of the model artifact you want to use. Uh, you can select it there and basically you can perform your inference on that particular version, version of the model. So this, this is a pretty uh, easy and cool way to play with your model, I would say. Uh, so it's running. And also uh, the demo uh, automatically logs the inference results uh, on your weights and biases dashboard, which basically ensures that you can go and take a look at uh, you know the inference results, or you can figure out which were the configs exactly used to produce uh, them, uh, produce a particular inference result on your weights and biases dashboard. So uh, it kind of looks like this. So. As you can see, this is the hazy image, uh, and uh, given uh, and given this particular hazy image, our model predicted this particular image. So uh, let's take a look at some of the more uh, uh, some uh, you know images while uh, our app loads. Uh, so you know, kind of looks really shitty. This image also looks a little better than the hazy image. And okay, this is a real life image. So uh, considering that it looks pretty well. And uh, mm -hmm. again, the performance is so-so. Like the same image. Ah, this is a pretty good performance. I would say like a, a lot of haze in the foreground is uh, cleared uh, well by the model. And yeah, this is one of the more interesting uh, results. I just, uh, you know, like took a photo from uh, from uh, a neighborhood uh, that I visited uh, some time ago and I just applied it. So uh, you can see that the haze in the foreground is kind of cleared. And this image was basically taken from uh, the original implementation of the authors. The authors basically used this image to showcase the power of this model back uh, when it was uh, back when the paper had come out. So as you can see, it's it's just a raw photo of uh, somewhere from somewhere in India and uh, and uh, the model actually performs pretty well in removing the naturally induced haze in this particular scenario. So uh, oh, it seems our app has loaded. Let's open our app. So uh, we can kind of, you know, use our own images. So let's give it a try. Let's do something like, let's let's uh, take an image from, uh, you know, Delhi and see uh, how it uh, uh, performs. Because Delhi, as we know, is currently facing a really crucial pollution problem. And uh, let's see if if uh, D uh, this image dehazing model, AODNate, can help us, you know, clarify some of the images or not. So if I open this up, uh, let's select the version of the model which didn't explode in terms of gradient um, and hit submit. So as you can see that it has started inferring. What it's going to do is basically fetch this particular version of the model from Weights and Biases Artifact and perform inference for us. So it's asking us to paste our API key, which we will oblige. It's basically our weights and biases API key, and let's see, it's still working. It's loading the model. And interesting thing is that once you have loaded the model, it's uh, you know it stays loaded. It's uh, not gonna take this long every time uh, when you run because uh, for the first time it's fetching the model from the artifacts and then loading it. Uh, so that's why it's taking a little bit of time.
and voila, we have a kind of clean image uh, of Delhi. Uh, let's let's uh, let's give it a try on another image uh, uh, from Delhi itself. Uh, uh, let's see how long it takes. It was pretty fast this time as uh, we had expected. So yes, uh, here's the image dehazing model performing not that great, but okay for uh, what it's worth. Um, I would really encourage you all to go and check our GitHub repository, which hosts all the notebooks and also all the code base that was used to create this app, uh, to train the model and uh, to basically clean our data set and visualize our data set. Uh, you can use all the notebooks that are linked in our GitHub repo. Uh, and uh, well, uh, that's it uh, from my end. I'm open to you. Uh, you can ask me anything. Anyone has questions? Uh, not a question, more of an observation. Uh, that uh, probably I noticed that the more vivid the color map, the better the uh, final results also tended to be. See, the, the uh, more color, correct, right? That is the, I noticed, even yes. the uh, Delhi photo, the uh, cotton candy that he was carrying on his head, and they, that had a much more vivid hue in terms of what it is. Yes, so probably, yes. Right? So probably yeah. that's an observation more than anything else. So where you see the uh, algorithm performing uh, much better, I was more of a consequence of the color map on the image itself. Probably something that uh, we can use to tweak the model or uh, improve the uh, algorithm. And just an observation, nothing more. But it was an excellent uh, presentation. I would, I would, I would, I would say this is an uh, really this is an excellent observation, and I'll try to give an explanation as to why the, this is the case. So as we have seen, uh, uh, you know. Uh, with respect to the nature of our model that it depends on the atmospheric scattering model, uh, right? So uh, what uh, we are probably seeing is an overemphasis on the on learning the A value, uh, which, which basically constitutes our KX, yes. which is basically we are right. learning with respect to our K estimation module. So uh, one of the more interesting things, uh, if you notice is lacking in this particular formulation of image dehazing is that it is mm -hmm. not dependent on the depth value of the uh, uh, of the image. So image. it doesn't have a perception of how far the haze is or how closer the haze is. Uh, we can kind of forgive the paper for this kind of formulation because it's five years old and there have been mm -hmm. since uh, new state of the art methods, which kind of deal right. with the depth. And so in a lot of the uh, images we perform inference on, you can observe that uh, it, uh, when the haze is being removed, it's kind of being removed from the foreground, but the background is kind of still kind of lingers on. Uh -huh, so uh -huh, uh -huh. This, is, this is one of the byproducts of, uh, you know, I would say an obsolete formulation of the image dehazing problem. Good point. Very good point. Correct. So the depth is also something that the correlation, depth correlation on of the haze is also something to be factored in. Yeah, there's always room for improvement as I say. Excellent. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, very uh, well formulated and uh, you know taken through. I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any any. And the question? and my son really enjoyed the fact that you are a Minecrafter. So as a Minecrafter himself, uh, nice, he was very nice. much. Yeah, he came and constantly was. Uh, What's Minecrafter uncle doing? So kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Uh, hey, thank you, Shomik. Uh, I have a question. So, so if we consider haziness also as like unwanted information added to the pixels, so why, or did you try using any of the existing, you know, denoising uh, techniques like auto encoders to uh, remove the haziness from images? Uh, really interesting question. So, uh, I I am basically asking a counter question. If you don't mind, like. Uh, exactly what an autoencoder is, right? So uh, that's uh, what we have to uh, uh, first ask ourselves. So an autoencoder is basically a model which uh, basically takes uh, takes some form of, form of your data. It encodes your data into a low dimensional latent space. By latent, I mean a hidden space. And basically trains a decoder uh, version uh, to basically 
uh, retrieve the information to reconstruct uh, the same information from that particular latent space. So what we are not doing here is basically uh, uh, not uh, having a distinct latent space uh, to be uh, clear. Otherwise, our K estimation model is technically an auto encoder if, if you consider it to be like that. Uh, we do not have uh, distinct encoders and decoders. What we are basically, uh, this is because we want to avoid, uh, you know, downsampling our images as much as possible. And this is something I think uh, we mentioned as well. Yeah, so uh, the multi-scale design of EODNet. So uh, as you can see, it's combining uh, features uh, in multiple, uh, from multiple scales, from multiple convolution layers. Uh, uh, this is uh, done uh, for two reasons. First, uh, first of all, to avoid van va vanishing gradients, uh, which uh, you will often encoder if you're training a very deep autoencoder. And also the second thing is to basically propagate features from earlier uh, uh, convolution layers where the image has not been downsampled that much. So I, uh, in, in uh, TL, TLDR, my uh, response would be an autoencoder would not be a good uh, option to solve this kind of a problem. Just because it downsamples the images first before it encodes it. Back. Yes. Uh, yes. Because the... your your uh, because you do not want to create a low dimensional representation of your image and want to preserve the uh, signal in the image as as much as possible. Okay. Uh, and uh, another question I have is that uh, do you know this transient atmospherics that's uh, scattered um, uh, model? How is that created and does it also account for things like seasonality, um, where on the globe you are present and all that? Uh, because no, that no, no. Uh, no, the atmospheric scattering model is basically a very uh, rudimentary uh, formulation of the, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, his, uh, his in images in general, I would say, uh, as I have mentioned uh, uh, before as well. Uh, so, uh, I, okay, one of the things uh, uh, I don't think that, uh, your global position adds anything of consequence if you add it as a parameter to your atmospheric scattering model. But one of the crucial things that is actually missing uh, from the atmospheric yeah, uh, scattering way. model. I'm sorry. I, I spoke to my family. Don't worry. Oh, I'm just Sure, no uh, so yeah, as I was saying, one of the more crucial uh, uh, insights uh, the, or parameters, I would say, that is actually missing from the atmospheric uh, scattering model is the depth per perception of the image. So uh, uh, if uh, if you see that the dehazy uh, model is actually consists of you know uh, hazy images which were created uh, by introducing this haze artifact based on the images and the de depth maps which were present in the original NYU dataset. Uh, so, so uh, basically, uh, what uh, de image dehazing problem as a challenge expects you to do is also formulate this depth. That how far is the haze from uh, the perspective of this camera, and uh, this this overall uh, perception of the de depth. Otherwise, uh, and since this uh, formulation is lacking, we are not getting as good uh, reconstructions as we would expect our model to be. But I would think that global positioning will have an effect because the angle at which you receive light also determines how it will be scattered. Uh, not everywhere you are going instead, to receive. Uh, okay, I, I get what you are uh, pointing. Even uh, with that that respect, uh, as you can see, the that we are not uh, de depending on any angle of light. Rather, we yeah. are taking a global uh, formulation of our transmittance uh, or radiance in general. So yeah, you're right in that respect that uh, if we take an angular formulation, uh, maybe that would increase another parameter, let's say theta, uh, uh, that would introduce in this particular formulation uh, uh, that uh, that might improve the uh, image dehazing formulation. Thank, and one last question. Uh, so uh, does the the brightness, right? Like, like for example, the, the light reflecting uh, out of a bright surface, does that also correspond to this uh, this problem formulation? Uh, the no, no, because that is local illum illumination. All we are depending on is the global illumination. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else has a question? Yeah. Hi, Sumit. It was a great presentation, and I'm Shakti Vel. And I have a small example. Let's say um, I'm classifying and recognizing a image or a 
for example let's take a soil recognition um will this model take the consideration of uh, it is considering haze um, which could be also mist or dew let's say in summer days uh, the heat waves uh, comes so will this take into consideration the uh, different parameters like mist um, heat waves and so so the image like while in haze the image just gets uh, overlapped by a mist but while on heat waves are produced on summer the image gets distorted so what will be the how the model will perform at that time of input okay uh, this is this is probably the best question uh, so uh, uh, you are absolutely right we are just formulating for uh, you know as as uh, uh, we mentioned earlier that we are just formulating this problem uh, for uh, the presence of aerosols uh, right so mist fog dust etc but uh, you know this uh, the when when you have uh, uh, you know like uh, due to heat waves or something like that you have distortions in your image they are not accounted by this particular problem formulation it's a problem formulation for another image restoration task which which is called uh, you know restoring from a certain kind of dis uh, distortion there are other image restoration tasks uh, you know like uh, low light enhancement uh, if you take an image in a dark place uh, there's not much light in the image or if you have a very down scale uh, down sampled image and you want to uh, rescale it back without you know uh, without upsampling artifacts uh, so there are there are a lot of different cases where you can apply image uh, restoration techniques but uh, the point of this uh, report is not or this paper is not to actually give you a general baseline for image restoration but to show how to formulate only this particular uh, uh, dehazing image dehazing problem so tldr is basically no for the uh, for the use case that you are mentioning there are other papers which actually tackle that but not this paper got it thank you anyone else would like to ask question we have quite a few folks in computer vision so i was expecting more questions on that hi sumit hello so uh, hi uh, how uh, best it will do compared to the histogram equalization uh, open cv histogram equalization we can do and we can remove the uh darkness and we can increase the brightness right so uh how good it is going to do compared to that uh really good question uh so uh, what is the point of training a neural network if it cannot so instead uh, of i mean to say instead of training the network I'm, so exactly i'm trying to uh, uh um, answer your question so uh what uh, you're asking is what is the point of training a neural network if a classical method overpowers it am i correct Mm. Yeah, I mean to say, uh, if I, if we have to train the data, we should take some time, right? It, it may take one one day or two days, maybe. It depends on the training data. Instead of that, you, we can use the open CV, and we we can use the histogram equalization and just ah. remove the. Uh, yes. Uh, so so uh, okay. Uh, I got your question now. Let me try to clarify why uh, we need machine learning in some cases instead of classical techniques. So a classical technique, by classical te technique, I mean uh, an algorithm which is completely hard coded. There is no room for tweaking or changing anything as per the outliers in our data. That's where we apply machine learning. That's where we apply machine learning over standard computer vision techniques. So uh, our machine learning models are basically trained on outliers as well, so that it forms a way more complex generalization of the data let's say uh, uh, for a classical algorithm if uh, uh, there happens instances like if the light is falling in a certainly light a slight uh, change in the lighting condition the com complete algorithm breaks these uh, this is these are the kind of robustness which a machine learning model is supposed to provide you i am not telling that all machine learning models are good enough to beat uh, classical uh, classical computation algorithms 
but they are supposed to. That's uh, the application of machine learning. For example, I wanted to introduce this particular uh, paper as a very rudimentary formulation of the image dehazing problem. There are uh, other ways, uh, like you mentioned, uh, histogram equalization and, uh, uh, you know, uh, for even for low light image enhancement, there are techniques like auto, con auto contrast al algorithms or stuff like that. But what they cannot take care of is the edge cases. You, when you are deploying an algorithm or a model into production, you do not want there to be an outlier. So the performance of a machine learning model is not going to drastically change for even the outliers or the edge cases. At least got for it. a good machine learning model, they should not. Got it, got it. Yeah. Maybe we can process through OpenCV first. If, if the accuracy is not good, then we can go with the model. Uh, yeah, a lot, a, a lot of uh, the cases in the uh, business pipeline uh, that uh, is an option. So, uh, my personal uh, uh, experience, uh, I uh, I can say that uh, you know uh, these kind of yeah, algorithms, two numbers very good. Uh, these kind of uh, you know classical algorithms uh, work really well when you have to go for the speedy options. For example, I'm trying to incorporate this as a pre-processing pipeline in training an object detection model. That cases I would probably first go with uh, a classical algorithm. Uh, maybe not OpenCV's implementation because that's slow. Uh, I'll uh, go with a vectorized uh, implementation in JAX or TensorFlow. Uh, uh, but uh, when uh, uh, these kind of models uh, shine is basically when they perform the best on all kinds of outliers. So that means uh, that depends on uh, you, you know really good training data, uh, really good benchmarks, and uh, really good uh, formulation of the uh, problem itself. Okay, got it. Now got it. we are Thank back question. Okay. And how long is yeah. Okay. Anyone has. Any other query? Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Somak, for such a brilliant session. Um, and uh, yeah, there are no more questions. So we'll take a break and then we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, before we take a break, uh, I just want to conclude my session using, it has been yeah. an honor to yeah. speak, uh, to present this uh, uh, report in front of you. So uh, okay. I'll again, uh, for the last time, I'll encourage you to visit our GitHub repo, which uh, I'll uh, share on the chat uh, with you, everyone. I'll share the link to this report with uh, you as well. I encourage you to go and run the uh, the training notebooks, uh, actually, because it takes hardly like, uh, you know, an art to train this model on Google Colab. Uh, and it's free uh, on uh, the free GPUs. Uh, so I encourage you to go and train the models. Play with the Grad.io app, uh, which we have built. Uh, you can submit your own uh, images and uh, test them out. Uh, so yeah, like uh, I encourage you to play, play with the implementation as well, if you wish. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samik.